Hello, and welcome to the Biohazard Safety Training Module. If you're viewing this video, that means you'll be working with cells at some point during your project. The purpose of this video is to help you to avoid or deal with any biohazards that might arise during the course of your experiments. Overall, biohazards are classified as one of four biosafety levels. The least dangerous biosafety level is BSL-1. BSL-1 includes agents that are not known to cause any diseases in humans. For instance, the E. coli in your gut or animal cell lines that are non-infectious are both BSL-1. BSL-2 agents are able to cause mild diseases in humans. For instance, influenza or hepatitis A and B. It is important to note that BSL-2 also includes human cell lines that can host BSL-2, 3, or 4 pathogens. Therefore, if you're culturing human cancer cells, even though they are not directly pathogenic, they still have the potential to host more serious pathogens, so they are classified as BSL-2. However, animal cell lines are still BSL-1. BSL-3 agents include diseases that are potentially fatal but treatable. For example, SARS, West Nile, and rabies viruses are all classified as BSL-3. More serious viruses that are not treatable and often fatal, like Ebola or smallpox, are classified as BSL-4. Here at Villanova, we do not work directly with any BSL-2, 3, or 4 agents. However, some of our labs do contain human cancer cell lines that are technically classified as BSL-2 since, again, they can harbor BSL-3, 4, or other pathogens. Therefore, if you're working in a lab with human cancer cell lines, you must treat everything as if it was at least BSL-2. However, if you're only working with E. coli or animal cell lines, your lab can be classified as BSL-1. Regardless of the biosafety level of your lab, you should always follow these five basic lab safety rules. First of all, food and drinks are not allowed inside the lab. They must be left outside before you enter. You should also not bring food inside the lab to cook it in the microwave. This could potentially contaminate your food. Likewise, you should not store food or drinks in the lab refrigerator as this could also lead to contamination. Once you're inside the lab, Always close the door and keep it shut. When working in the lab, you should also always wear the proper PPE. For example, gloves are required to be worn at all times. Goggles are also mandatory PPE. They must be worn at all times. A lab coat is recommended, but not required. A lab coat is beneficial in that it will protect you from any spills that may occur, and it will also protect your clothes from any spills or stains that are, might potentially happen. If you're in the lab and your cell phone rings, it is best to leave the lab and answer it outside. However, if you must answer the phone inside the lab, be sure to take off your gloves before you touch your phone. This will prevent any potential contaminants from getting onto the phone and then later onto your face or hands. At the end of the day, when you're done with all of your experiments, be sure to thoroughly rinse and wash your hands with soap. This will remove any contaminants that may have gotten past the gloves during the course of your experiments. So, to review, food and drinks are never allowed in the lab, nor should you cook or store your food inside the lab. Eating, drinking, smoking, and applying makeup are also not allowed in the lab. Phones can be used in emergencies if you remove your gloves. Speaking of which, Gloves and safety glasses are required at all times. You must wear safety goggles if you're working with organic or flammable solvents, though. Lab coats are not required, but they are highly recommended to protect your skin and your clothes from any damage that may occur. And finally, the lab door must remain closed at all times, and you should always wash your hands before leaving the lab. If you are working in a BSL-1 or BSL-2 lab, there are some special rules you must consider when transporting samples between labs. First of all, the exterior of any samples must be thoroughly sterilized with 70% ethanol, and a secondary container should always be used to carry it. Preferably, that secondary container should have a locking lid to prevent any spills in case you trip.
When leaving the lab, remember to always remove your gloves before opening the door. You don't want to contaminate doorknobs. And when carrying your samples between floors, you should not use the stairs. Instead, use the elevator. It's much safer and there's less of a risk that you'll actually trip and spill something. So, to review, when transporting biological samples between labs, you should always thoroughly sterilize the exterior of the samples with 70% ethanol, use a secondary container, and use the elevator, not the stairs. If your experiments include cells, you'll have to sterilize media and other reagents before you start your experiments. And to do so, we, do, we typically use an autoclave. Autoclaves use high temperature and pressure steam to sterilize things. Therefore, they have their own inherent hazards. And it's best if you follow these guidelines. First of all, always put any liquids you're sterilizing in a secondary container, just in case they spill out. This happens often, and it creates a huge mess. You should also loosen the lid on the container, but do not remove it completely. This is to avoid any pressure buildup inside the vessel as it heats up. To prevent the lid from falling off, apply a small piece of tape to keep the lid in place. When you start the cycle, do not open the door until the cycle is fully complete and you see this message. If you open it prematurely, high pressure steam could escape and severely injure you. When you open the autoclave, be sure to put on some orange thermal gloves to protect you. Keep in mind that anything coming out of the autoclave will be very, very hot. Finally, you should never autoclave anything containing bleach. This includes even a culture that you might have sterilized by adding 10% bleach. Do not put anything containing bleach in the autoclave because it will create volatile vapors that are highly toxic and pose a suffocation hazard. It's not uncommon to have to evacuate a building after bleach is mistakenly autoclaved. So, to review, when you're using the autoclave, Always put liquids in secondary containers and loosen the lids on any bottles to prevent explosions from pressure buildups. Once the autoclave is done, and make sure it's completely done, the cycle is complete, wear orange thermal gloves to open and retrieve your samples as they may be very, very hot. And by all means, never autoclave anything with bleach. Once you're done working with your cells or biological samples, you want to decontaminate them fully to prevent any possible cross-contamination or buildup of biohazardous wastes in the lab. There are several ways that we can decontaminate cell cultures depending on the type of cells that you're working with. If you're working with animal cells, you want to take them into the hood and fully aspirate all of the media off of the flask or plate that you're working with. We can do this because the aspirator tank should always contain about 10% by volume bleach, which will sterilize the, any media and cells that you aspirate away. Once you're done aspirating, be sure to put the Pasteur pipette in the glass waste, and you can put the flask in the biohazard box. Small bacterial cultures can be contaminated quickly by adding 10% bleach in a one-to-one -one ratio in a glass bottle. This glass bottle should be kept in the hood in case there are any bleach vapors. After the sample has been incubated with bleach overnight, it can be poured down the drain and rinsed out with tap water. But this is not an option at some other institutions. Always check with your supervisor first. Large bacterial cultures should be sterilized in the autoclave at 121 degrees C for 30 minutes. Once these cultures come out of the autoclave, they can be poured down the drain. Autoclaving is preferred over bleach because it doesn't pose any chemical hazards, and bleach tends to damage a lot of the polypropylene uh, flasks that we use for bacterial cell culture. For instance, this flask here in the video would become cloudy after exposure to bleach. So, to review, animal cell cultures Take them into the BSC and aspirate any liquid away, sterilize that with bleach. You can then throw your used plates or flasks into the red biohazard bags. Small bacterial cultures can be decontaminated with 10% bleach in a 1 to 1 ratio and then drained down the sink. Likewise, large bacterial cultures can be autoclaved and also poured down the sink. Just as a reminder though, never put bleach in the autoclave. 
In some instances, you may also need to decontaminate an accidental spill. If this occurs, immediately seal the original vial and dispose of that properly. Then blot the spill on the bench with a paper towel and put that in the red biohazard bag. Then come back and thoroughly rinse the area with 10% bleach. Once that sat for a few minutes, blot that dry as well and dispose of the paper towel in the red biohazard bag. Since bleach can leave residue sometimes, we also prefer to sterilize the area with 70% ethanol after the bleach. Once again, wipe this dry with a paper towel and dispose of the paper towel in the red biohazard bags. If you get any samples on your skin, thoroughly wash them with soapy water for about 15 minutes. The goal here is to thoroughly remove any samples that might have gotten onto your skin. If you get anything in your eyes, immediately go to the eye wash station and try your best to keep your eyes open under the cold water for 15 minutes. Holding your eyes open under the water is difficult to do, but it's your best chance of removing any contaminants from your eyes. So to review, if there is an accidental spill of cells, immediately wipe it dry and put the paper towels in the red biohazard bags. Then sterilize it twice with 10% bleach and 70% ethanol. If any part of your skin is exposed to cells, wash it thoroughly with soapy water for 15 minutes. If anything gets into your eyes, wash your eyes out with the eye wash station for another 15 minutes. Finally, immediately notify your supervisor of any spills that may occur. By now you may have noticed that it's very common to use 70% ethanol to sterilize surfaces and equipment in the lab. However, you must be very careful with 70% ethanol because it is also very flammable. There may be some instances where you're using 70% ethanol and Bunsen burners in tandem to keep a bench sterile. In these cases, it is very important that you sterilize the bench with ethanol before you light the Bunsen burner. Use a paper towel to thoroughly dry the bench and thoroughly dry your hands as well to remove any residual ethanol before lighting the Bunsen burner. Once both the bench and your gloves are very dry, then you can light your Bunsen burner. Once the Bunsen burner is lit, do not spray ethanol near the flame as it will create a fireball. Do not try this on your own. Also, if you need to respray your hands, do not get them near the flame as the ethanol on your gloves will light your gloves on fire. Once you're done working with the Bunsen burner, always remember to turn it off before you leave the lab. Never leave an open flame unattended as it might cause a fire. So, to review, when working with Bunsen burners and ethanol, always clean with ethanol before you light the Bunsen burner. Make sure all ethanol on the bench and on your gloves has been dried off before you light the flame. Once the flame is lit, don't spray ethanol near the flame as it will create a fireball and if you have to respray your gloves, don't let them get anywhere near the flame. And finally, do not leave a flame unattended. Even if you have to leave for 10 to 15 seconds, turn off the flame and then turn it on when you get back. If you need to work with any animal cell lines, you'll probably work with them in a biological safety cabinet. While these BSCs are designed to specially protect your samples, they also come with a few unique hazards. For instance, like a fume hood, BSCs also work by sucking air into vents inside of them. However, a crucial difference between BSCs and fume hoods is that BSCs vent their air to the lab instead of outside. Therefore, if you work with any volatile dangerous chemicals inside the BSC, you will be directly exposing yourself to those chemicals. So, if you need to work with anything like that, always work in the fume hood. Do not work with them in the BSC. BSCs also sterilize themselves with ultraviolet lights. While UV lights are great at keeping surfaces sterile, they are also mildly carcinogenic. So always wait for the UV light to turn off before you enter the BSC. Carbon dioxide incubators are also commonly used in animal cell culture. They should always be maintained at 37C and 5% CO2. If you ever see the CO2 level drop, that means one of the carbon dioxide tanks on the side of the incubator has run low. However, do not attempt to change the regulator on these tanks unless you have been properly trained. 
Instead, immediately contact a grad student or a supervisor that can change the regulator over for you. No matter what kind of cells you're working with, you probably have to use the negative 72 freezer at some point in your research. If you have to store any samples in the freezer, make sure you wear some kind of gloves to protect yourself from the extreme cold. Also, limit the amount of time you have the freezer open to prevent samples inside of it from thawing. The temperature inside the freezer can raise very quickly, so please abide by this rule. Also, only remove the samples that you need. Leave all of your other samples inside the freezer, since freeze-thaw cycles can significantly damage many of the samples that we work with. If you are taking protein or DNA samples out of the negative 20 or negative 72 freezers, it is very important that you not thaw them at high temperatures. While this will increase the rate of thawing, it will also damage your samples. Instead, thaw them at room temperature or on ice. If you need ice, it's available over in the core genomics lab of SEER. Please only use the scoop provided to get ice since other scoops may be contaminated. Also, do not use the ice for your food or drink. If you ever need to dispose of any samples containing DNA, they must be degraded first with 10% bleach before pouring them down the drain. This is to prevent the spread of any antibiotic resistance genes to the environment. Simply add 10% bleach to your DNA sample in a 1 to 1 ratio, shake it around a bit, incubate it, and then you can pour it down the drain. So to review, never thaw protein or DNA samples at high temperatures. Instead, thaw them on ice or at room temperature. Once you are done with proteins, freeze them at negative 72 C. And while you're working with any proteins, keep them as cold as possible to keep them from denaturing. Once you're done working with DNA samples, freeze them at negative 20 or negative 72 C and try to avoid DNA's contamination whenever possible. Try not to sneeze into your samples, don't use any contaminated buffers, etc. If you need to use DNA for your experiments, you'll probably run agarose gels at some point. Use special care when working with agarose gels since they contain ethidium bromide, a known carcinogen. For this reason, any work with ethidium bromide should be isolated to a specific spot in the lab. This is to prevent ethidium bromide from contaminating other areas in the lab unnecessarily. Likewise, any liquid waste containing ethidium bromide, such as the waste from a gel extraction, should be collected in its own distinct waste container, away from the other chemical wastes. Any solid waste containing ethidium bromide, such as pipette tips or used agarose gels, should also be collected in their own waste box. To view ethidium bromide, you also need to use ultraviolet light, which is also a carcinogen. For that reason, you should always use a UV shield of some sort when turning on the UV light. If you have to move the stationary UV shield shown here, make sure you're using a UV face mask and wearing a lab coat to protect your skin from any potential UV exposure. So to review, ethidium bromide is a carcinogen that may cause DNA mutations and cancer. UV light is also a potent carcinogen and it can cause significant damage to your eyes. Therefore, ethidium bromide use should be isolated to a specific area in the lab. All waste containing ethidium bromide should also be collected separately and marked appropriately. And you should always use some kind of UV shield to protect yourself from UV exposure. Finally, another way to sterilize liquids in the lab is to use syringe filters. These filters have pore sizes that are 0.2 microns or lower, allowing them to retain any bacteria. However, it is important to note that viruses can still get through these filters. If you're using one of these filters and it clogs, quickly replace it with a new filter. Do not continue to apply pressure to a clogged filter. If you do, it will eventually rupture and spray its contents all over. For this reason, it's always best to syringe filter liquids inside the BSC. Just in case there is an explosion, the sash will protect you. However, if the BSC is unavailable and you need to syringe filter something outside of the hood, remember you should always wear goggles just in case there is a rupture and spray. So, let's review some of the things we've learned today. First of all, gloves and safety glasses must be worn at all times in the lab. If you're working with any hazardous organic solvents though, you should wear goggles instead of glasses. You should also use a secondary container to transport samples between labs preferentially the container will be closed.
Very importantly, you should also never autoclave samples containing bleach. And when you do use the autoclave, beware of steam. Only open the autoclave when it is fully done. If you need to decontaminate some old cell cultures, you can use 10% bleach with small cultures, or you can use the autoclave. Either way works, and then you can dump the cell waste down the drain. If you spill a biological sample, sterilize it immediately with 10% bleach and then 70% ethanol. When working with a Bunsen burner, do not spray ethanol or bring ethanol soaked gloves near the open flame as they will create a fireball or light your hands on fire. Also, do not use hazardous volatile chemicals in the BSC because BSCs vent their air to the lab. They do not vent to the outside. So if you need to use these chemicals, sacrifice sterility and use them in the chemical fume hoods. If you're ever in the lab and you notice the CO2 levels on the incubators are low, don't attempt to change the regulator to a new tank unless you've been specifically trained for it. Instead, immediately alert your supervisor or a grad student and they'll change it for you. Next, always use some sort of gloves when retrieving samples from the negative 72C freezer since it's so very cold. Also, minimize the amount of time that you keep the freezer open since it does warm up very quickly and that can compromise most of the samples inside the freezer. When you're working with DNA and proteins, always thaw them on ice or at room temperature. Do not thaw them at higher temperatures even though it might thaw quicker. You'll damage your samples and ruin your experiments. In addition, if you run your DNA samples on agarose gels, keep in mind that ethidium bromide and UV light are potent carcinogens. So treat them with caution and dispose of them properly, and always use proper protection when using UV light. Finally, use special care when you're using syringe filters, since they may explode when they get clogged. And you should always wear goggles when using these syringe filters, even if you're filtering something in the hood. Wear goggles. So, that should cover just about everything. Remember to talk with your supervisor about any specific biohazards that might pertain to your individual project. If you ever have any doubts or questions, please contact your supervisor or any of the other chemical engineering faculty, and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. One last note, in addition to this biohazard safety training, all students must also complete a chemical safety training module. In addition, if you're going to be working with any human fluids or blood, you must also complete a separate training session for bloodborne pathogens. Ask your supervisor about both of these training modules. And with that, we're done. Thanks again for your time, and I wish you the best of luck in your research.